Appreciate it. It's good to be back with you. I want to start this morning with a Bible verse. It says 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. And it says that physical exercise has some profit to it, but godly exercise lasts forever. And so what happens is physical exercise is something that kind of comes and goes. It's, you know, certainly as you get more white hair like I do, physical exercise seems to be less important than it was at other times. So physical exercise can, can come and go based on physical stuff. But on the inside, you're not old. You never get old. On the inside, you live forever. And so doing spiritual exercises is something that you've got to do all the time to stay strong. It's not something that, oh, i got gray hair, so I don't do exercise anymore, so I don't do spiritual. Now, spiritual exercise has to stay with you, has to be part of what you do all the way through. So I want to talk to you this morning about some spiritual exercises that really are significant for all of us. They've kind of fallen out of practice in American society like a lot of things have. But I want to take you back and show you some things historically and how important this is and why and, and what it's done. Um, history is a lot of what I do, if you recall from last year. We're, we're named wall builders out of the Bible book of Nehemiah where the Nehemiah rebuilt the walls. And so you rebuild things that are torn down. And that's, history is so important in the Bible. That's where God says to recall the former days, recall the former times. All these verses in the Bible about going back and looking at our history. So I want to do that. And so as I take you back to look at some of the history of America, and get you back into that history. Let's see, it's not cooperating with me. Guys, would you check that remote plug back there? It does not act like it's doing what it's supposed to. We had it working before service, guys, so we're in good shape before service. There we go, all right, we got it. So in the story of America, if you look at the story of America, the Bible will be key to this. I want to take you back to the very first settlers that came to America. The first settlers that came landed at Cape Henry, uh, Virginia in, in 1607. At that point in time, they got out, they erected a cross, they knelt, they read the Bible, they had prayers, they dedicated the land of the Lord. And that became practice for so many of, the, of those that came. The next group that came to America, for example, were the pilgrims. These guys came and the Bible was central to what they did. As a matter of fact, inside the U.S. Capitol, inside the rotunda of the Capitol, is a painting of the pilgrims. That painting is 14 feet high. It is 20 feet long. It is a massive painting. It would cover most of the front up here. Center to it is the Bible. The Bible was key for these guys. They spent hours a day in it. They had just come through a period in world history where for a thousand years nobody studied the Bible. Nobody read it. They couldn't get at it. And so this is like a, a new book to them. They're going, man, have we been doing it wrong for a thousand years. Let's do what this says. And so they got back into it and changed their lifestyle, the same with the Puritans who came after them, which is the third group that came to America. It was so common for this Bible to be the heart of what they did that when you look at those early paintings of those early colonists, you always see the Bible in their hand. I mean, this was the book they carried with us, you know, like we'd carry a smart device today. They carry a Bible with them everywhere they go, and they were trying to learn to think according to it. So as you go through all that period of time, you go colony after colony. The final colony of the 13 was added in 1732 with Georgia. And again, Georgia, that was the big deal was the Christian faith and sharing the Bible and knowing the Bible. And so they asked George Whitfield to be the chaplain for Georgia. He came over and John and Charles Wesley to be chaplains for Georgia. So Whitfield is significant because in the 1732 time when, when George is founded, that's about when the Great Awakening Revival begins. It's a huge national revival we had that spread over a period of time. Uh, that revival actually ran for 40 years. Now, one of the interesting things, people today, th we need a revival in America. We don't have an idea what we're talking about. A revival spans decades, as it did in the First Great Awakening. It is a transgenerational movement. It is a lot of hard work. People don't change instantly. You have to teach them how to think differently, and as you do, it takes time. And so that First Great Awakening lasted for 40 years. And the same way, the Second Great Awakening was from 1801 to 1877. It's 70, 76 years of revival. People didn't know it was a revival until after it was over. Historians are the ones who said it was a revival. At the time they were doing it, they're just trying to grow in Christ and, and, and learn what the Bible says. So George Whitfield is probably the most famous name in that first Great Awakening. And there's others. You, you've got people in the Great Awakening like Jonathan Edwards and Samuel Davies and Gilbert Tennant. But Whitfield is, the, is a big guy everybody knows. And Whitfield spent a lot of time in that awakening. Uh, he actually had 34 years that he preached here in America. He, on horseback, seven times rode from Maine back to Georgia and back to Maine, back and seven times preaching all along the way from end to end across America. And he ended up preaching 18,000 total sermons. He preached so much that it is estimated that 80% of all Americans physically heard him preach a sermon. 
Now you think what that means, how many communities do you have to go to for 80% of all the people who live in the country to physically hear you preach a sermon? And that's what he did. So it was a lot of, lot, a lot of hard work. Well, at about the time that revival ends, something else begins. And, and what really kind of started in America at that point in time, at this, this ending of the revival in about 1770, 1775, was we said, you know, we need to become different politically. We need to be a different nation because all this Bible teaching we've been doing is changing the way we think. And so we have what's called the First Continental Congress. Leaders from across the 13 colonies get together. And when they get together, it's an interesting time. Now, these guys all went through the Great Awakening. They're, they're all part of the Great Awakening. They've learned to think differently. They're thinking differently from the way Great Britain is. And so as they come together in 1774 the first time, they didn't know each other. I mean, the guys from Georgia had never been to Pennsylvania. Think how far that is on horseback. And the guys from Massachusetts didn't know anybody in South Carolina. And so they get together for the first time. It's interesting. What is the first thing this political body did when they got together? Well, they opened with prayer. Well, yeah, we do that even at city councils. No, 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 not like this. These guys, first time they get together, they haven't even seen each other before. They opened with a two-hour prayer session. That first session of Congress began with two hours of prayer, and they didn't just stop there. It's significant that John Adams, who became our second president, he wrote his wife Abigail and said, Abigail, you wouldn't believe what happened this morning. Not only did we have prayer, we studied four chapters of the Bible this morning, and God so spoke to us out of one of those chapters that we actually think there's a chance that we'll be able to win the conflict. Now, at that time, we have no army, we have no navy, we are British citizens. And the British have been shooting at us since 1770, so we've gone four years of being shot at. And we have no defense, but somehow reading that Bible passage in Psalm 35 turned them around. And so he wrote his wife, Abigail. He said, Abigail, he said, I must beg you to read that psalm. Read the 35th psalm to your friends. Read it to your father. And her father was the pastor of their church, Reverend William Smith. And so John Adams' father-in-law was a pastor. He said, you've got to show this to your dad. Let him tell the church. And by the way, you read it. By the way, show it to all your friends. And so they wanted everybody to know what had happened when God spoke to them that morning out of a Bible study in Congress. Now, we didn't hear anything about Congress starting that way or two hours of prayer or Bible study or anything else, but that is exactly what happened. Now, from that, we, get, we move into the, to the period of time where the, we're now saying it's gone far enough. Six years of shooting bullets at us, and we've been trying to reconcile with Great Britain since 1765. So we went 11 years of trying to work out the differences, and we don't want to separate. We're British citizens. We want to stay British citizens. But it just wouldn't work. I mean, they, again, been shooting bullets at us for six years. And so that's when we separate. We do the Declaration of Independence. We announce that we're becoming an independent nation. So when we announce that we're becoming an independent nation, that's when full-fledged war breaks out. And so you've got all these conflicts that are happening, the Battle of Lexington, and all these different battles that happen. And what has happened now is America is now at war with what used to be the mother country, with, with the chief trading partner. Everything we got came in on British ships. It was, you know, we, we depended on the British for everything and trade because we were British citizens. Now we don't have that trade anymore. So we got shortages going across America. And one of the shortages was so significant that it got the attention of Congress and Congress acted to relieve that shortage. And the shortage was of Bibles. Because we can't get trade in anymore, because the British have our ports blockaded, we, we can't get Bibles into America anymore. And that's a serious problem. So the Committee of Commerce, actually this is what they, they did. The use of the Bible, is, this is their declaration, the use of the Bible is so universal and its importance is so great that Congress will order the Committee of Commerce to import 20,000 Bibles from Holland or Scotland or elsewhere in the different ports of the states of the Union. We've got to get Bibles. America can't survive without us all knowing the Bible. So Congress is actually, what a different political climate that is today, right? I mean, how different is that? But you see, that's where when Christians get involved, when we have Christian leaders in an office who pray for two hours and actually read the Bible, this is a big deal to them. And so that, that goes back to the type of leaders we choose. And significantly, by 1781, we've now finished the final battle in the American Revolution. We, we've gone all the way through the battles. And when that happens and the British lay down their arms, it, it is a massive change in America because for the first time in nearly two centuries, we're no longer under the kings. What the kings say doesn't matter to us anymore. We're an independent nation. And the reason that is significant is one of the laws that had been passed by the kings back about 1620 was that if you live in America, you can print no Bible in the English language. Now, we could print Bibles in other languages, and the first Bible printed in America was John Eliot, the Apostle of the Indians, 1661, except it was in the Massachusetts or what we call the Algonquin language. It wasn't in English. 
We printed Bibles in every language under the sun. Ojibwe and Cherokee and Shawnee, and we printed them in Russian and French, Italian, Latin, Greek, and every, everything except English. We're not allowed to print them in English because there is a national state-established church in England, and they're going to tell us what Bible to use. But as a result of what happened in that last battle, we're not under the British anymore. So what happens was within a year from that last battle, we come out with the first English language Bible ever printed in America, 1782. It's one of the rarest books in the world. There were 10,000 printed. There's eight left today in private hands. I actually have one of the, the, the original eight. We own thousands and thousands of, of documents from, from our history. And in that Bible, it's interesting that it was printed by a guy named Robert Aiken. Now, what's significant about him is he is the official printer of all the records of Congress. Everything that Congress puts out, he is the guy that prints it. And when you look inside that Bible, you find there that there is actually a congressional committee that has been overseeing the work on the Bible, and the Bible actually has a congressional endorsement in front. It says, Resolved, the United States and Congress assembled recommend this edition of the Bible to the inhabitants of the United States. Congress with an endorsement in front of the Bible? Oh, yeah, more than that. As a matter of fact, why did Congress even do this in the first place? Well, when you look at what, why Congress did it, Robert Aiken told the Congress why this was needed. He, he said very simply, this book will be, as he said, a neat addition to the Holy Scriptures for the use of schools. We need this Bible printing because we've got to have Bible in schools, and this will be a perfect one for that. This is actually the handwritten document that he did showing, and it, you can read it there in his own hand, a neat edition. And so we came out with this Bible, a neat edition of the Bible for schools. Congress endorsed it. There it is. We're putting the Bible in schools. Now, again, that is so distant from what we hear today, but that was what we were doing at that time. And in 1783, we now signed the peace treaty to end the revolution. So we've won the revolution, the American War for Independence. We, we now have this Bible printed in English that we can use in schools, and now we're signing the peace treaty. And the peace treaty is signed by three Americans. On the left is John Jay, the center is John Adams, the right is Ben Franklin. And this is the actual peace treaty. You can go to the State Department today up on the fifth floor of the John Quincy Adams State Drawing Room, and you can see the treaty that made America an independent nation. At the, on the left side, you'll see four signatures. David Hartley was the British ambassador. And then you have John Adams, Ben Franklin, John Jay. And up top, you see 10 articles in the treaty that made us a nation. Look at the title on the treaty. The largest writing on the entire document is right over here on the side. It says, in the name of the most holy and undivided trinity. Kind of sounds Christian to me. I could be wrong. Imagine that was our thinking through the founding of America. We were not secular. We didn't want to be secular. The Bible was to be the center of what we did. We even acknowledge that in the document that secures our independence. Well, when you go back to the start of this thing, you have a lot of leaders who are involved in this, people like Patrick Henry. I mean, he's a great example. Nearly every student in American history today will read the speech of Patrick Henry. The speech that he gave, the famous speech, was given at, uh, to the Virginia legislature March the 23rd, 1775. And at the time he gave the speech, 1775, we are still British citizens. They're still shooting at us. What are we going to do? And the, the thought is, do we separate? No, we can't separate because we don't have an army or a navy. We've got a bunch of farmers with squirrel guns. We've got some school teachers that maybe have a pistol or something. We've got no military. So how do we do this? And so all the pressure is you can't do it. You, you just have to keep taking it. You, 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 just, you can't separate. And so that's the mentality. And by the way, when he gave his speech, he gave it to the Virginia legislature. Where were they? St. John's Church in Richmond. That's where the legislature met. They met inside the church. So he's delivering the speech in front of in St. John's Church in Richmond to the legislature. Look at what he says in the speech. This is what students read in the history books. He says, Sir, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature has placed in our power. The millions of people, we had three million in America back then, he said the millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess we're invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. I mean, we may not have an army. That doesn't mean we're going to lose. He continued. He said, besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destiny of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It's to the vigilant, the active, the brave. The war has actually begun. The next scale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms, and it did. Next thing they heard in the way of national news was the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Battle of Lexington, first battle of the Revolution, Pastor Jonas Clark took his men out. Seventy guys from his church went out to take on the 700 British coming to town to take all the stuff away. The next battle was the Battle of Concord. Reverend William Emerson had 300 guys from his church out there taking on the 700 British coming. He said, he said the next thing we hear, it's going to be coming from the north. It's going to be the sound of clashing arms, and indeed it was. He said, our brethren are already in the field. 
Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? He said, gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of change and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. That's that famous speech. Now, here's the interesting thing about that speech. This speech that he gave was 14 sentences long. That's what I just read to you, 14 sentences. The question I have is how many Bible verses did he use in that? I would say that as you look at it, he did not, there was not a single time he referenced the Bible and said, John 4.12 says, none of that. You see, back then we read the Bible so much we didn't have to tell you when we were quoting the Bible because we all knew the Bible because we had it in schools and everybody was raised on it. In that speech he just gave, he, he quoted 11 different Bible verses. These were the Bible verses just quoted by Patrick Henry. Now, here's the question I've got. How did he pull that off? Because he's just given an extemporary speech. He just stood up and started speaking to the crowd. He started speaking to the legislature, and he's answering the arguments that have been thrown up. And in the process of delivering that, he quotes 11 Bible verses. How did he do that? Jesus answers that. Jesus told us in Matthew 12, 24, he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out your mouth is what you already had in your heart, whether that's hate or bitterness or anger or rage or kindness or gentleness or Bible verses. Those Bible verses came out his mouth because he had those Bible verses planted in his heart. Now, significantly, that goes to the, the thing of knowing the Bible. He had a knowledge of the Bible. He had knowledge of what it said. He actually had Bible memorization. He had memorized the Bible. You can't bring out of the inside what's not there. And Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we're talking Bible memorization at a level that is kind of unusual for us today, but it was not unusual back then. Let me take you to another example. George Washington, when he became president of the United States in 1789, he was inaugurated as president. He decides, you know, it would be good to make a tour of the 13 states and kind of have unity and work on that. So he starts doing that. In 1790, as part of this tour, he goes into the colony of Rhode Island, into the state of Rhode Island now. And as he goes into Rhode Island, a Hebrew congregation in Newport hears that George Washington is coming, and they, that Hebrew congregation writes him a glowing letter. President Washington, we thank God has raised you up. You have done so much for religious liberty. And just, just effusive. It's, it's praising Washington. And so he responds back in a very kind letter back to them. And what he does responding back is he has a short letter. This is what he says. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree and there shall be none to make him afraid. He said, may the Father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness in our paths and make us all in our several vocations useful here and in his own due time and way everlastingly happy. Now, that little letter that he wrote back is two sentences long. Question is, how many Bible verses did he quote? Washington just quoted 10 Bible verses in that. The entire letter is one Bible phrase after another. As a matter of fact, that part where he talked about the vine and the fig tree comes from minor prophets. He used that phrase 29 separate times in his writings because in the Bible, sitting under your own vine and fig tree means you get to have your own private property that you can enjoy. The king doesn't own it anymore. You can now, and as Hebrews here in America, as Jewish folks, you get to have your own congregations, your own synagogues. You're in a place now where you have your own property that you can have. The king doesn't own everything anymore. So in two sentences, he quotes 10 Bible verses. Uh, last year when I was with you, I, I shared, and by the way, these are the 10 Bible verses. Uh, so last year when I was in Micah 4.4, 4, is said under your own vine and fig tree. Last year I shared with you Ben Franklin, the longest speech he gave at the Constitutional Convention, Thursday, June 28, 1787. In that speech that he gave at the Constitutional Convention is where he called for prayer. And in that speech, he had a 14-sentence speech, and in that 14 sentences, he quotes 14 Bible verses. Now, this is your least religious founding father, but again, how does all this stuff come out of them? They stand up to start giving speeches, and what comes out is the Bible. It comes out because that was what was in them. All these verses came out of Franklin in this extemporary speech. He usually wrote his speeches, but this speech he just he, he delivered. He just did it extemporaneously. All of that came out because of what Jesus said. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, which means they had planted God's word in their heart. They had done Bible memorization in a serious way that we often don't think about today. And that's what I want you to see is it doesn't matter who was back then, they did this. And, and you know, even as you take it and look at this Bible memorization from the standpoint of 
what we did Bible memorization, let's say, in history. Uh, you take Bible memorization, look at it in history. Let me take you back to someone like Thomas Jefferson, who's one of our least religious founding fathers. He's the first president to have a full term in Washington, D.C. George Washington, John Adams, presidents before him, but they were in Philadelphia and New York. He gets a full term in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is a brand new city. So they're building the city. Well, he has actually chosen to be president of the school board of Washington, D.C. If you can imagine, the president of the United States is also president of the school board. It was in D.C. And he is the man credited with authoring the plan of education for Washington, D.C. public schools. So what did the Washington, D.C. public schools do? Well, here's the report given at the end of the first year. Jefferson started their plan of education. He's the least religious founding father. And the first year's report says this. It talks about what students are learning. 55, now these are students in first and second grade. 55 have learned to read in the Old and New Testament and are all able to spell words of three, four, and five syllables. 26 are now learning to read Dr. Watts hymns and they can spell words of two syllables. Wait a minute, we're talking first and second grade. You're talking kids are learning to read out of the Bible. That's the book from which you learn to read. Continues. He says, of 59 that did not know a single letter, did, they were completely illiterate, 20 can now read the Bible and they can spell words of three, four, and five syllables, and 29 read Dr. Watts hymns and spell words of two syllables, and 10 words of four and five syllables. Now, okay, we get it, they're reading the Bible, but what's the deal with Dr. Watts hymns? Dr. Watts refers to Dr. Isaac Watts. He's considered the greatest doctrinal hymnist in, in probably Christian history. He is the guy who came out with hymns that we still recognize today. Some of Isaac Watts hymns, things like, am I soldier of the cross, Jesus shall reign, O oh God our help in ages past, joy to the world at the cross. I mean, all these hymns he did. And hymn books back then did not have music in them. You had a cantor in the church that sang the melody and you would repeat the melody. You had a book with the words in it, but you didn't have a melody in it. Well, that's the other book they're reading. They're learning to read at school with the Bible and with Watts hymnal. Those are the two things that Thomas Jefferson put in public schools to teach students to read. It's that way all the way through American history. If I take you, for example, past Thomas Jefferson, if I take you to 1816, New Jersey Public Schools, look at what the public schools in New Jersey said students, what they were learning, what they were, were, were memorizing. It says, all the scholars of the first and second classes, first and second grade, commit to memory portions of the New Testament or Psalms, a lesson of the catechism, several hymns, and the text of the preceding Sabbath. So whatever the, the sermon was about last Sunday, we memorized all those Bible verses, in addition to Watts hymns, in addition to all these passages out of the Bible. It continues, it says, of the scholars, one of the scholars has committed to memory the book of John, now we're talking first and second grade, has committed to memory the book of John, the first 30 Psalms, together with the 119th Psalm. Are you kidding me? A first grader? 119th Psalm. The majority have committed to memory the Gospel by John. So the majority of first graders, second graders have learned and memorized the Gospel of John. It says in the third and fourth classes, one of the scholars says, uh, of these classes is committed to memory the Westminster Larger Catechism, the Commandments, Christ's Sermon on the Mount, and 10 chapters in John. So this is what we're getting in public schools all this time. Let me take you on decades later. Let me jump into Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania in 1892, Public School Report of Pennsylvania on what they're memorizing in public schools. It says very simply, let the selection, talking to teachers by the way, you're having students memorize, here's what you need to do. Let the selection for the week be, if possible, two in number. The first from the Bible or sacred song, and the second from the world of literature, prose or verse. So you're going to memorize two things a week, Bible and something good out of literature. Say, for example, the 90th Psalm and Lincoln's speech at Gettysburg or Lead Kindly Light and Longfellow's Psalm of Life, or the 23rd Psalm and Lowell's Once Every to Every Man or Nations, or the 19th Psalm and Home Sweet Home, or My Country Tis of Thee and the Chambered Nautilus, or the 13th chapter of Corinthians and the Last Rose of Summer, and it continues, it says, here we go, or any of the other hundreds of good things, moral, religious, patriotic, descriptive, or sentimental, in the best sense of the word, that we should all that we should all be very glad to have securely lodged in the memory. Notice. And let the teacher always commit to memory what is here required of the pupil. This is what American education was for all those years. Notice the emphasis on scripture memory. Scripture memory. You just memorize scripture. Why? Now there's several reasons you memorize scripture, but this is what we did until 1963. In two cases, Abbott and Schimpf and Murray Corlett, the Supreme Court said, hey, you know, this deal of having the Bible in schools, we're not going to do that anymore. Now, the justice has told us why. 
Um, I've been involved in seven cases of the U.S. Supreme Court. If you don't know why the justices do what they do, you read their decision. If you do, this is what's in their decision. It said very simply that if portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could be and had been psychologically harmful to the child. We, the court, has now discovered that the Bible causes brain damage, so no more Bible in schools, no more memorization. What a change that was. So most of us have grown up in this period of time. Even though we're Christians, we're no longer in a culture that reminds us how important it is to know God's word, to read God's word. Even Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, two religious founding fathers, memorized and knew God's word. So it's a, it's a different culture that we face at this point in time. Now, the result of that, fairly interesting, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who is a founding father, uh, he is a signer of the Declaration. He started the first Bible Society, started the Sunday School Movement. Benjamin Rush, he's called the father of public schools under the Constitution, and he said the Bible, when not read in schools, is seldom read in any subsequent period of life. In other words, this is what we used to teach in education from the time you were young, and because of that, it stayed with us all the way through, no matter how old you got. Now, what we know statistically is the older you are when you start studying the Bible, the harder it is to make a habit out of it. If you make a habit when you're young, it stays with you. So that's why we had this emphasis. And it is significant that where we are right now today is the result of having generations that no longer start when we're young. You see, today we have the highest biblical illiteracy in American history. There's 196 Christian colleges and universities in America. I talk with a lot of those presidents on a regular basis. And they say that right now the Christian kids coming out of Christian churches to the Christian colleges don't know the difference between Jonah and Moses. Can't tell who's what. Matter of fact, I was talking to a guy recently. He has personally taken on mentoring one of the students because that student, raised in a Christian home, raised in a Christian church, had never heard the name Adam or Eve before anywhere at all. And when he mentioned Adam and Eve, the guy said, who? What? You don't know Adam and Eve? Never heard it. So we're at a point where that knowing what we used to know culturally is no longer the same, which is why we now have a lot of the, the societal cultural conflicts that we do. We also have right now only 14% of the Bible, of Christians read the Bible on a daily basis. So I want to, I want to take this to show you what happens if we will come ourselves individually as Christians. All right. I'm going to start doing some spiritual exercises here. I may be white hair, may be out of shape physically, but spiritually I'm going to get in shape. And part of that spiritually getting in shape is going back into God's Word and then memorizing parts of it. The previous result, when we did memorize parts of the Scripture, you had people like John Trumbull. John Trumbull was a founding father who was also, um, he was on the Supreme Court of Connecticut. This guy, when he was four years old, had finished reading through the King James Bible from cover to cover for the first time at the age of four. When you take John Witherspoon, another founding father, he is a signer of the Declaration. He was also the president of Princeton University. When he was four years old, he too had re finished reading the King James Bible cover to cover at the age of four. As a matter of fact, the biographers that were written of him back then, they said that he was able to read the Bible at the age of four and required to memorize portions. At one time, he could repeat nearly all the New Testament. So repeat the entire New Testament because he's memorized it. That was the emphasis we put on spiritual exercises. Uh, you take someone like, like Lemuel Haynes, black preacher in the American founding. He started churches all over America. Uh, he was a soldier in the American Revolution, one of the famous Minutemen. Uh, actually, in his churches that he started, on Washington's birthday, he would have a sermon every year on George Washington's birthday. But he was the first black man in America to have a higher degree of education, the first black man in America to actually have printed sermons. The guy was unbelievable. He preached all the time. He was one of the most respected preachers in America. As a matter of fact, this guy literally, he, he printed 5,500 sermons, not just what he preached. Those are the ones that were printed and published, 5,500. And in his sermons, he would often just pop up and, and, and start speaking. He'd be asked to speak somewhere. And when he did, they said in a single extemporary sermon, in other words, just off the cuff, he was asked to, to speak. He said in a single extemporary sermon, he usually referred to 20 or 30 texts of Scripture, always in his quotations giving chapter and verse. So just off the top of his head, he starts speaking, and it gives you 20 or 30 verses, and he can tell you where everyone I'm at. That's Bible memorization. That is, that is hiding God's Word in our heart. We're told in Psalm 119, that word have I hidden my heart. That's, that's what memorization was. I'll give you one more example. Daniel Webster, he was in the U.S. Senate for 20 years. He considered the greatest orator in the history of the U.S. Senate. He was also involved in every major Supreme Court case in his lifetime, in his adult lifetime. He's considered the greatest attorney of any generation. He was such a good speaker. We have records of the Supreme Court that when other opponents heard they would have to face Daniel Webster at the Supreme Court, they dropped the case because it's, it's a waste of time and money to fight Daniel Webster. 
Daniel Webster standing beside his Senate desk. That is one of the very few Senate desks that still exist today. In the U.S. Senate, that desk is still there. What happened was Webster back in the day took that pen knife and carved his name in the bottom of that desk so he would know which was his out of all the senators. Now, it's interesting because that pen knife still exists today. The curator of the U.S. Senate has that pen knife, and we know how Daniel Webster got that pen knife. We know it from the guy who gave him the pen knife. The guy who gave him the pen knife was a school teacher at his one-room schoolhouse. Daniel went to a one-room schoolhouse, and James Tappan, Master Tappan, school teacher, this is what he reports about that knife. Now, they were in public school. They are getting ready to dismiss for the weekend, and this is what James Tappan tells all the students all ages. I held up a handsome new jackknife to the scholars, and I said the boy who would commit to memory the greatest number of verses in the Bible by Monday morning should have it. This was Saturday afternoon. They went to school on Saturday. They're getting out for Sunday. He said, you've got tomorrow to memorize Bible verses. The one of you that memorizes the most, you can have this. Now, Daniel was the youngest kid in school. He was six years old. All the other kids were older, and Daniel had health problems. He was often very frail. So this is what James Tappan reports. They come in on Monday morning. He says, many of the boys did well. But when it came to Daniel's turn to recite, I found that he had committed so much to memory that after hearing him repeat some 60 or 70 verses, I was obliged to give up. He telling me that there were still several chapters yet that he had learned. Daniel got that jackknife. I guess so. Over Sunday, he memorized 60, 70 verses and still had several chapters more to go when he was stopped. See, that was the emphasis that was there in, in schools all over. So. You, you look at the examples, and by the way, Daniel Webster to this day has a statue in the U.S. Capitol, uh, one of the best Bible orators ever in history. But this is the kind of heritage and history we had. So why should we do any of that today? Now, I'm going to encourage you to start some spiritual exercises like reading and, and meditating on the Bible, memorizing the Bible. Bible memorization, there are three benefits I want to give you as I close. The first benefit that comes from Bible memorization, memorizing Bible verses, is that it creates muscle memory. It's like any other muscle in your body. If you use it, it gets stronger, and it, it's more effective at what it does. Well, the same with muscle memory. If you start memorizing Bible verses, you'll find that your ability to recall phone numbers goes up, your ability to recall faces and names and everything. It just goes up because it's exercising something that God has given you. And if you don't exercise, it doesn't work nearly as well. So muscle memory is one. Your whole memory will improve all, all across the board. The second thing that it does is memorizing Bible verses helps you with meditation. Now, meditation is what the Bible says is really important. You have all these verses where it says, if you'll meditate on these things, your change will appear to all, 1 Timothy 4.15. All these verses say when you meditate on God's word, that's when it gets into you, and that's when, you, that's when you're able to change and make substantive differences. So what happens by memorizing verses, it gives you something to meditate about, or if I could use the term, it gives you some digestion ability, and I say that because I'm a cowboy from Texas. And as such in Texas, we raise cows, we raise sheep, we raise goats, we raise all these animals, they graze the pastures, they all chew their cud. Chewing their gut is the way they digest their food. They can take it in really fast, but then they have to sit there and work on it for a while. They get all the nutrients out of it, and that's what meditation is. You can digest the food by memorizing the verses, but once you get that verse in your mind, now you can chew on it, and now you can get nutrition out of it. Now you can get things you've never seen before um, because there are actually diseases where people can eat all day long and their body does not process the food and they can starve to death in the middle of eating. I mean, literally, you, it's not how much you take in, it's how much you can digest and process. Let me give you a simple example of that. If you take uh, a Bible verse that everybody, do you guys know what Psalm 23, 1 says? What is it? That's right. The Lord is my shepherd. Real easy verse. Psalms 23, 1 says the Lord is my shepherd. You can memorize that, and then, then you, can, you can read that verse in five seconds, but you can think about it for hours simply by chewing on each word. Let me give an example. There's five words in that verse. What if we put the emphasis on the? The Lord is my shepherd. What does that tell you? You can chew on that for a while. Or if I say the Lord is my shepherd. That's a whole different meaning. I can chew on that for a while. Or if I say, the Lord is my shepherd. That's a whole different meaning again. Or if I say, the Lord is my shepherd. Or if I say, the Lord is my shepherd. Every one of those, you're just, you're getting all the, you're just digesting, getting all the nutrition out of there. That's what happens when you memorize. It gives you something to work on 
all day long, you can apply God's word and you, you start getting stronger spiritually. I mean, it is, it is physically, it's 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. So that's the kind of stuff that happens. That's the second benefit we get is that we have the ability to be able to digest. Now, let me show you how this works. Because if you take God's word and if you take and read God's word, that will give you great knowledge. You will know what's in God's word. So read God's word, you get knowledge out of that. But if you will take God's word and then meditate on it, that's different. If you take God's word and meditate, then you get understanding, which is different from knowledge. Knowledge is one thing. Understanding what to do with it is something else. And then once you meditate and understand, then you can apply that. And when that happens, now you have wisdom. And wisdom is what you're after, not knowledge. Knowledge is not what does it for you. What does it for you is having knowledge on which you meditate, which gives you understanding, which leads you to do the right things, which gives you wisdom. So notice the sequence. It all stems around meditation. If you don't get the meditation done, it just stays knowledge. It never becomes understanding and wisdom. And that's where maturity comes from, is, is getting past that. And so meditation, that's the second thing it will do for you. It will give you some digestion. The third thing that it does, it will give you those nutrients. The third thing that it does is it helps you to have a biblical worldview. That is to think the way God thinks. Great example of that comes from this man, Daniel Webster. We talked about him earlier. Brilliant, brilliant guy. In his day, the biggest theological debate in his day was that of the Godhead. Uh, the three can't be one. That's not even mathematically possible. What scientist would tell you that three equals one? It doesn't happen. There's no Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Like, there was a lot of people who bought that, especially a lot of intellectual people, because it made sense. Three isn't one when it comes to math, so how do you do that? So he was asked, as a brilliant, brilliant scholar, he was asked, what do you think about that? And he said, I, frankly, I don't get it. I don't understand. He said, I, I don't comprehend how Jesus could be both God and man. I don't, I don't get the Godhead. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, for people today, if it didn't make sense to them, they would just walk away from it. That's not where he stopped. He said, I cannot comprehend how Jesus Christ could be both God and man, and I would be ashamed to acknowledge him as my Savior if I could comprehend it. This is way above my pay grade. I don't get this, and I'll tell you, that's good that I don't get this. He continued. If I could comprehend him, he could be no greater than myself. In other words, if I understand everything there is about God, then that means he's human. He's like me. I need a God that's a whole lot bigger than I am. He continued, such is my conviction of my accountability to God, such is my sense of sinfulness before him, and such is my knowledge of my own incapacity to recover myself that I feel that I need a superhuman Savior. I need something that goes beyond my understanding. He says, I believe that God exists in three persons. This I learned from scriptures alone. He says, he says, nor is there any objection to this belief that I cannot comprehend how one can be three or three can be one. He says, I hold it my duty to believe not what I can comprehend, but what my maker teaches me. See, when you get God's word in, you start thinking the way God wants us to think rather than the way the world wants us to think, a very secular thing. We're told in Romans 12, 2, and the, Living Tra and the um, Phillips translation says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. And what happens is because we don't hide God's word in our heart and meditate on it and chew on it and digest it, we start thinking like the world thinks about so many different areas and issues that are out there, and we just that's not what we need to do. So I'm encouraging you to take and get spiritually active and exercise. You may not be physically active and exercise, get spiritually active. And one of the easiest things to do is memorize Bible verses. Easy. If you just memorize one verse a week, that's fine. Just remember it, recite it each day, and you'll start thinking about it, and you'll start making an application out of it. It'll go from knowledge to understanding to wisdom, which is what it needs to do. But it starts with that chewing on, on those things. So Bible memorization, a really good deal. Let me encourage you, 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, to get spiritually active and exercising. God bless you guys. Thanks for letting me share. Aloha. My name is Jonathan Steeper. I'm the senior pastor at Kalihi Union Church. I'd like to welcome you to come and visit us. We are a family where we hope you'll meet and hear God and develop relationships with His people. Please come and join us at any of our Sunday services, our weekly gatherings, or our many special events. We look forward to meeting you and growing in faith, hope, and love together. Mahalo, and may God bless you.